Hi, Dr. Griga. Good afternoon. My name is Isha, and I'm a high school student interested in, interested in being a veterinarian. I'm so excited to welcome you to the interview series on the careers of veterinarians. Thank you so much for joining us. Let me start with an introduction of our speaker. Our speaker today is Dr. Rosa Garriga, a wildlife veterinarian and conservationist. She completed her veterinary degree from Barcelona, a master's in wildlife medicine from the University of London, and a PhD from Universidad Autónoma de Barcelona. She worked for five years as a field veterinarian and techni technical advisor in a rehabilitation and reintroduction center for orangutans in Indonesia and another five years in a chimpanzee rehabilitation in Sierra Leone. She has been in charge of the health care of more than 250 orangutans and 100 orphan chimpanzees in the rehabilitation centers. She has also trained staff, supervised volunteers, developed and applied new technologies and medical procedures. Dr. Gariga has veterinary consultancies of animal handling and general improvement of the facilities in several countries, including Guatemala, Gambia, and India. Since 2011, she has been working on the conservation and protection of the wild fauna and their habitats in Sierra Leone. She has conducted field research, including social science, wildlife surveys, GIS, and use of new survey technologies. Dr. Gariga also collaborates in education and environmental protection projects in Sierra Leone to promote sustainable development, enabling and empowering the local population to address environmental issues and development. Currently, she is consulting for various field research for the conservation and protection of chimpanzees and their habitat in Sierra Leone. With this introduction, let me extend a warm welcome and thank you to Dr. Gariga for chatting with me today. Okay, thank you, Isha. So first, could you tell us about the various types of veterinary and conservation work that you have done? Okay, well, um, yes, I can explain you a little bit. Let me go through. As you said, first I did my university, my degree in veterinary medicine in, in Barcelona in 1904. So it's a long way, a long way. And um, after that, I actually work for, I work in, in, in several small animal practices in Barcelona. Um, but uh, for about four years, I worked. But I wasn't really happy with that. I didn't really, I liked it and enjoyed it and I learned a lot. But uh, my, my um, interests were more into wildlife medicine. But at that time, there were no opportunities in Spain to study wildlife medicine. So I kind of like, um, I, I kind of learned on myself, myself on exotic animal medicine which was the closest to what I could do. Um, but still, I didn't like it very much. So eventually, I find out that there was this master's in, in, in London, master's in wild animal medicine. And um, I, well, uh, I kind of like decided I wanted to do that. So it took me a couple of years to, you know, save the money to be able to travel to London and to do the, the one year course. So when I was there for one year, um, I kind of like, for me was a really amazing experience. Not only getting, not only learning about wildlife medicine, but also about uh, getting to know a lot of people and a lot of, uh, you know, opening the eyes about all the things that you could do uh, around the world. So I really wanted to explore and work in, um, um, uh, in countries where the wild animals were, uh, you know, they, the origin of the wild. To, to Borneo, to Indonesia, as a six month uh, volunteer as a veterinarian uh, in a rehabilitation center for orangutans. So it was really exciting because uh, for me it was my first like real far away country to work. Um, and uh, I went there as a, as a volunteer. So I went there for six months, but after two, three, four months, I realized it didn't make any sense to be there for only six months. 
you really can do anything in six months. It is kind of it's is either your personal experience or really you want to dedicate your life to work with wild animals. So I said I could stay there for another six months for a year. And after a few months, I told the organization I could stay for another year and then another year. And I carry on being there for almost five years. So when I went there, um, I, I came to um, uh, the Orangutan the Foundation International, which is the organization who runs the place. It's led by uh, Virute Galdikas, who is a lady, was a woman who is, um, uh, it's um, famous on uh, being the first uh, woman researcher who work and studied orangutans in the wild. Uh, she's on the same, it's the same, uh, same kind of time as Jane Goodall for chimpanzees and Diane Fosse for gorillas. She was the lady for orangutans. So um, it was a, an amazing experience. She she did research her PhD when you know in the I don't know maybe the 70s 80s she did her PhD in studying orangutans in the wild in Borneo and after that she set up this uh, rehabilitation center for orangutans um, uh, orangutans uh, I don't know if you are aware but um, Borneo has the third largest uh, rainforest in the world after the Congo and the Amazons. So it has um, uh, an amazing biodiversity. And orangutans are the, the, uh, the only grape apes in, in, in Asia. So uh, she, orangutans, the problem with orangutans and with all the primates and the great apes uh, in Africa as well, is that they are being hunted by, because the habitat, because of the deforestation. So Borneo is, um, for the last years has been a place where uh, they have cut down the forests, the rainforest, to plant uh, oil palm, palm oil. So large uh, tracts of forest are being cut down. So the orangutans uh, lose their habitat and become a problem. So are usually are being killed, and the babies go into the the trade, the illegal trade. So the orangutan care center in quarantine, it was a place where confiscated orangutans would come to us and we would nurture them and keep them and, 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 and uh, bring them back to, to health. And, uh, and after some years, we normally, we managed to uh, reintroduce them back to the, into the wild. So that was uh, the clinic where I work uh, when I when I got, went there in 1999, December 1999, I, I I I went there and there were about 120 orangutans in captivity in the center. When I left in about 2004, there were um, almost 250 orangutans in captivity. So uh, even though you need to think that we released about 80 orangutans within the years I was there. And we had some deaths. So imagine that amount of orangutans, of orangutan orangutans that we'd reach our place. I think here I have some pictures where you can see, uh, well, this is an orangutan is being held in captivity and uh, that we rescue and uh, orangutans uh, uh, would come into the, to the orangutan care center in quarantine and we'll uh, take care of them. We'll do our quarantine procedures Usually in the wild, orangutans spend about between six and eight years with a mother. So you cannot just release a baby orangutan. They would not survive in the wild. They need to be taken care of until they are kind of strong enough and uh, good enough to, to be released back into the wild. So at the center, we had more than 100 uh, people, local, local dyads working with us which would take care of the orangutans, would they take them back and would they take them into a nursery forest? The orangutans will spend the day in the forest and then they will bring them back into their uh, night enclosures. Um, when they were very small, the mothers would take care of them, mothers, sorry, the, the girls who would take care of them as, as foster mothers. 
So I spent there about uh, almost five years. And after that, I, I left and I went back to Spain. And a friend of mine um, told me that um, they were looking for a vet in Sierra Leone in a, orang in a chimpanzee rescue center, but they didn't have uh, money to, to hire a veterinarian. So I said, you know, I thought, okay, I could, um, I could either, you know, stay at home uh, looking for the perfect job, or I could just go uh, to Sierra Leone and help out for six months. I also was going there for just six months. And, um, and I went to Sierra Leone and um, Takugama Chimpanzee Sanctuary. And there I spent, um, I went, as I said, I went for six months and I spent five years again. <laughs> um, so uh, when, I re when I went to Africa, it was so different from Asia. There is nothing, you know, so completely different. Not only the culture, not only the people, but also the chimpanzees. Chimpanzees and orangutans are two different worlds. <coughs> Sorry, I have a little bit of a cold. <laughs> So when I went to Sierra Leone, um, um, I went there and I, the, the rescue center, we, there was about 80 chimpanzees. And um, again, the same issue as, as uh, Africa, uh, sorry, as Asia, the same issue. Deforestation is one of the main problems, uh, the loss of habitat the animals lose their place where they can live so they become a problem because they rape uh, farms or simply they just they just a problem for the farmers or for the people because they have no no forest left so chimpanzees again um, they they are killed and the babies become uh, pets or they get into the, the illegal trade so we confiscate them or we and they bring them to us and in the sanctuary we take care of them and um, we want well, we, we we keep them the problem with the chimpanzees is that it's not the same as orangutans chimpanzees are very much social they live in in community in big families and um, instead of orangutans they are more semi-solitary animals the, they don't live in communities. So the problem with chimpanzees is that they cannot be reintroduced into the wild easily because chimpanzees, they become humanized. They become, they lose the fear to, to human. So they can be very dangerous. Uh, if you release chimpanzees in, an, in a forest that is close by villages, the chimpanzees would probably go into the villages and they would not fear men. And then, then it's a risk for the people and for the chimpanzees. So reintroducing chimpanzees is not easy. So they stay at the sanctuary. And, um, and a chimpanzee can live between 50 and 60 years. So we are talking about um, a big problem. So that's when after five years being the, I work in the sanctuary as the veterinarian, but also as managing. One thing of this profession of wildlife veterinarian is that you normally don't only work as a vet. Maybe your vet work, uh, it's I know 40% of your time, but then the rest of the time you also have to help in different, in different um, areas of conservation. No? It's in education and it's in managing the people, it's training people, so in, in administration, so there are lots of different different aspects that uh, you need to really work. It's not just being vet. Um, in in I don't know if I have. So in 2010, uh, for some personal reasons, I returned back home, and um, I I was thinking whether I wanted to continue being a vet, a wildlife vet, and um, I was thinking, how could I actually help wild animals, chimpanzees or wild animals in general? Really, how could I better help them? Because being a vet, I could take care of them, but still, they were still coming into the sanctuary, and that was that's not a solution. 
So um, I discussed with my boss, uh, the, the director of the Takugama Chimpanzee Sanctuary, which is called Mbala, Mbala Amarasekarang. And um, I told him, we need to do something more. We need, to, we need to protect them. We need to stop them coming to us. We need to do more work uh, in the field. Um, but I had no, no knowledge on how to do that. And we were thinking of how we could reintroduce chimpanzees back into the wild, uh, knowing that it was a very difficult task. And the first thing we needed to know is what was left in the country. Where, how many chimpanzees were left in Sierra Leone? Where were they living? Um, uh, where were the places where we need to protect? Where were the places that maybe there are still room for more chimps to be reintroduced? So we plan to do a national census, chimpanzee national census. But that was a very difficult and very uh, big task uh, for us. Um, Bala, my boss, he he's a former accountant, so he went into conservation in chimpanzee protection by mistake. <laughs> he came across a chimpanzee, he rescued chimpanzee 30 years ago, and after that he started rescuing chimpanzees and then and up, you know, setting up a sanctuary and turning his career into conservation. So. So how can a, a, an ex accountant and an a vet uh, do a, a national chimpanzee census? So we, we asked for help to universities and big organizations, but we didn't get anyone to help us. So we eventually managed to fundraise enough uh, money, which we're talking a lot of money to do a, a census a survey across the whole country. But we managed to do that and we came across, uh, we found out that half of the chimpanzee population in, Chim in Sierra Leone were living outside protected areas. So it's about 5,500 chimpanzees living in, in Sierra Leone uh, were living outside uh, national parks or protected areas. So why? Uh, so we, didn't, we wanted to, to know what could we do to learn more about that and how to protect those chimpanzees. And that is when I decided to switch, uh, shift to more to field conservation research. So I started doing um, I started doing more studies in GIS, geographical information system, and, and using camera tabs and GPS, drones, and uh, and slowly we started doing like uh, census uh, surveys. Well, first we managed to get the money to do the national census. After that. Uh, we decided to focus on some specific areas where there seem to be a lot of chimps living in, in farms. So how could we, you know, uh, what we could do to protect those chimps. So that's when I started uh, writing proposals and looking for small money here and there to be able to go to those areas in Sierra Leone to do some studies. And I did a lot of uh, interviews and I put camera traps and even I used drones. And, 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 and work with the farmers and help them to improve their agricultural systems so the chimpanzees wouldn't be, wouldn't be seen as a problem, but more of a, an advantage. Um, so because we were actually helping them. And uh, slowly, slowly, uh, years would just go through uh, over these uh, almost 12 years, uh, we went through an Ebola. Uh, I don't know if you heard about the Ebola epidemic uh, that hit the country, which closed down the country for one and a half years. So we couldn't do anything. Takugama, the sanctuary, continued to be op open, <laughs> continued to be there because the chimpanzees would still be there and they need to be fed and they need to be taken care. But we couldn't travel there or you know, couldn't have uh, um, visitors or anything. It was very difficult times. Also, then we also had COVID, uh, which also has a problem, you know, cut, shut down the country as well. So it hasn't been easy, but we managed to do a lot of uh, work in the, in, the, in the whole country and uh, slowly, slowly building up um, a team of uh, um, an outreach team, which we do a lot of uh, field work and research. 
So in between all this, um, a friend of mine told me, why you, you know, with so much studies you've done in the field, why you don't do your uh, PhD? And I was like, well, you know, kind of my, I'm, you know, why should I do a PhD? I'm not really, you know, I'm uh, 50 years old. Uh, I don't really need it. But then uh, she was saying, well, I can do it by, um, by um, publishing papers and, you know, building up a, a thesis and I thought it was a very good for for Takugama and for the chimpanzees if I could put together all the research I have been doing over the last years and uh, I engaged into a PhD so I finished the PhD in 2018 and I studied basically the chimpanzees living in non-protected areas and in farm areas which was very interesting to see how chimpanzees can adapt to the change to the habitat change and how they survive in these uh, not very um, easy places. So since then, I'm kind of like stopped my vet work. Uh, I still I'm very interested. I still do some uh, occasional work in Barcelona. Uh, I work it also in a refuge uh, place for uh, stray cats and also stray dogs. Uh, but this is just uh, functional work that I do to like locuming. Um, I love parasitology and microscope. I do some teaching as well. Um, a lot of people wants to do, I, they like to go to volunteer in these um, developing countries and they don't really know what they're gonna, you know, it's not easy. It's a, you know, it's, it sounds very, very, um, how can I say it? romantic work, but it's hard. It's hard, and you need to be prepared when you you go to do some of this kind of work. Uh, so I do a lot of um, teaching as well, some training to people who wants to engage in this kind of uh, field vet work. Oh, sorry. Uh, here, some you know uh, the um, the conservation and and work I'm doing now research. It's very, very exciting, <laughs> even more exciting than just working in a sanctuary. It's, you know, working with chimpanzees and orangutans is very exciting, but also it's also very exciting going into the field and uh, doing surveys, uh, looking for, I don't know, you want to do a chimpanzee survey, you need to do, uh, you work with transects and uh, you need to walk transects and count nests and look for junk and and um, and remains of uh, and uh, and you need to do some it's it's an, it's kind of more biology <laughs> uh, biology work but it is you know it's a uh, uh, it's hard but it's very rewarding and you 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 get to see to to learn about uh, the environment and uh, it is so lovely it's just so lovely to see there's still some forests which are amazing and they need so much of help to be protected so we don't want to lose all this um all this uh beauty and um So yeah, this is more or less my 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 career life. Thank you so much for sharing um, your work and your career evolution with us. It is really amazing. Um, could you kindly share the most rewarding aspects of your career? For me, for me, um, I mean, I'm always talking about, I only work for like um, a small animal practice for about four years and then occasional locuming. But of course, my, my bulk of the work for the last 23 years, I actually work uh, in, in uh, developing countries. So for me, uh, the most rewarding aspects are probably the feeling that you are work, you're helping and people and animals in places where there is nothing. So, for example, in Borneo, I remember um, that uh, they they call me Doctor Rosa, and I and I and well, they call me always Doctor Rosa. But well, uh, it was interesting because 
at some days I have more people queuing at the clinic than orangutans I had to check. And I was telling them, I'm not a doctor. I am a vet. I'm an animal doctor. But they, they didn't have other means or they really liked me more. And um, I had people queuing for treatment. And I, 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 at the beginning, I was really reluctant because I was like, okay, I'm not a doctor. I shouldn't be doing this. But when you see that the, they have nothing else and that they could, you could help somehow, like, for example, I... I treat malaria, I treat wounds, I treat fevers, diarrheas, uh, parasites, I, I even assist birth. I, I, I seen people dying, um, uh, sickness. And, um, and it was really, I mean, I help as much as I could. And at some point I would say, I'm sorry, I cannot help you anymore. You need to go to hospital. But I had so many clients <laughs> uh, that, um, that it felt, I mean, for me, um, I realized that, you know, um, you could help in many ways. Also, it's, it's nice to be able to help uh, animals uh, at all sorts without thinking you need to charge them. Yeah, for me, I understand uh, the, vet, the vet profession is it's, it's, uh, something that you feel it very in deep and uh, people really have to like the profession. But again, it's, uh, you need to earn money to live. So a practice is to, to get money and to live and to help at the same time, but it's a, it's a business. So um, it was difficult in a, in a practice, if you get someone doesn't have money and you cannot help because if they cannot pay, you cannot do anything. For me, that was, that was I, couldn't, I couldn't deal with that. In these places, uh, you have little means, but at least you do as much as you can and you help as much as you can. And uh, for me, that was very important. Also, of course, living in this area, in these places, you learn a lot about new cultures like these pictures or new ways of life. And, and um, life and death, it's different the way they, they, uh, they live those things compared to more Western culture. Um, that's not, uh, it's common when you ask someone how many children you have, they will easily tell you, well, I have uh, six children, four alive and two dead. And, um, and they, for them, it's kind of like, that's life and it's that, and they accept it. It's, it's painful, but the way they, the life continues, they need to look for their food every day. They need to survive. So. You cannot really get into, um, you cannot stop uh, you, what you like because life continues. And that's, a, it, it teaches you a lot, at least to me. Also, uh, another thing for me was very rewarding is the fact that you become very resource, resourceful. You don't have many means. You have to think every day how to solve problems, how to get things done. In Western countries, you can just get on your phone and, oh, can you please, uh, I need to buy this, you know, Amazon. And then next day you have it home. But there, there, no. I mean, if you want to get oxygen, uh, in, in, I remember in Sierra Leone, uh, we needed to get dry ice to transport some samples. And uh, dry ice was nowhere to be found in the country, in the whole country. So we eventually managed to go into the company, Coca-Cola company. There was a, a, a factory that was doing Coca-Cola. So they had this um, um, CO2 that you could actually uh, get from a pipe. You put a, a, a back, um, a cloth pack, and then you could open the pipe and get some, um, some dry ice. So what are you thinking? You can become very resourceful and resolute. And it's good, it's good for the brain. It's just, you know, um, also, um, again, um, you have to expand your imagination and also and be very patient. I am a kind of like, mm, I'm not very patient, but I had to learn to how to be patient because in these countries, when it's not today, it's going to be tomorrow and not after tomorrow. And that's not a big problem. And for me also it was very, uh, very nice because I learned, uh, I met a lot of people from all around the world starting from my master's, uh, where I met a lot of people from 15 different countries. 
uh, because we were 15 in the in the masters and everyone was from a country different and it was so so nice and after that everywhere when i went to work they had a lot of volunteers and a lot of uh, um people coming from different countries so it is it is well for me um it is uh, very rewarding and well you get a lot of experience as i said not only in veterinary but in medical social cultural uh, everything so yeah for me these are the most rewarding aspects of my 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 work Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. It's really moving and it's really wonderful the impact that you have made on the world. How do you believe that the veterinary profession has changed during the span of your career? And how have you and other successful professionals adapted to this? Well, um, for me, um, how, the, how the, the, the profession has changed think that when I studied at university, we didn't have internet. Internet it didn't exist. Uh, so, I mean, internet, I was, it is amazing. I mean, uh, when I went to uh, London to do my master's, internet was uh, already was, you know, working, but it was uh, in the initial stages. So it was basically, it was basic. Now uh, you can do everything. We can we can now be doing this um, this meeting uh, and uh, you're recording it and being on the web so everyone can see. So these things have uh, I mean has a huge advantage. Being in remote areas where you are, if you can get some internet, um, it helps a lot when you're alone working as a vet or as a researcher and you have a question, or you have a doubt, or you have something. There is always someone out there that has an answer, and that's um, it's 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 huge. It's huge. Also, another thing that is really cool is that now veterinarians are more specialized. Uh, you know, uh, before a vet did it all. You know, it did dermatology, pathology, parasitology, uh, surgery. You know, uh, all, all all what what it could be done, um, and that's. Kind of like it's it okay but the problem is that you cannot be good at everything so um in the western countries uh it is great because you can you have an issue with a broken bone you can go specially as that special vet who is you know specialized in that uh, trauma and it can help you and be very good and sort out the problem maybe you know i couldn't do it um, this in developing countries is difficult to find. So often you rely on human doctors um, because working with great apes think that chimpanzees are genetically similar to humans in 99% and orangutans in 97%. So I used to work with, um, instead of uh, veterinary um, um, books, I used to to have most pediatric books other than, than veterinary books. For example, all my um, uh, drug medicines, all the doses I use, I use for human pediatric uh, doses other than than veterinary doses. So you rely, you know, you had a, a problem, a, you know, a big issue that I couldn't figure out or I couldn't know how to sort it out. I normally look for a specialized doctor uh, to help me out. And then, uh, of course, you know, the diagnostic tools. Uh, now it's amazing. You have uh, portable ECGs, you have portable X-rays, digital X-rays. I mean, uh, it, it, I mean, there's nothing, I, I'm still, sorry. <coughs> I'm still uh, using, um, a manual um, uh, blood analysis uh, in some uh, when I work when I used to work as a vet because I didn't have machines, but uh, of course this has improved a lot compared to when I started. That's really interesting. Uh, thank you for sharing those points. Um, what originally drew you into the veterinary profession? What did bring me to the interest? Well, um, 
I think I always like animals. I mean, that's, I think, what's the base of any vet. I think uh, um, almost every vet, every person who wants to study veterinary medicine is because they like animals. If you don't like them, mm, it's difficult, no? That you really <laughs> want to do that. So since I'm early age, I really, really like animals. And um, I really wanted to be either a biologist or a vet. But um, biology is, uh, when I did high school, I wasn't unsure what to do, whether biology degree or veterinary degree. At that time, I had some friends uh, older than me that were studying biology. And they were telling me that the future biology career had limited, um, limited, um, what's the word, uh, opportunities of work. And uh, I thought, okay, so what I could do is I could do veterinary, and then maybe if I if I if I have the the willingness, I could do biology. So I did veterinary because I really uh, well because I really like animals. But why wild wildlife? Why I wanted to work with wildlife? Actually, uh, when I was fourteen, I think a friend of mine, uh, well, a friend of a friend. She was English, and um, she gave me a book, uh, which is called uh, My Family and Other Animals from Gerald Darrell, who is a naturalist. Well, he was a naturalist. He's dead now. And, um, and I, I, I loved it. I love it so much. And so I read all his books, and I actually wanted to be like him. And uh, I wanted to, be, to work with wild animals. I think he was my kind of like uh, my, you know, some people, you know, like Jane Goodall or like, like David Attenborough or other, um, you know, mediatic people who are work with animals or they do documentaries or they are very involved with nature. For me, it was Gerald Darrell. Um, and, um, and actually, <laughs> uh, I, I really wanted to meet him, but he died before I actually had the chance. He, one of his, the things he did was set up um, a zoo in Jersey Island, Island in uh, in the Channel, in the um, in the Channel Islands uh, between England and France, and uh, it was a zoo only for endangered animals. So he only was uh, keeping their endangered animals to be able to breed them and have uh, be able to probably, maybe, reintroduce them back to the wild. So I thought this, um, this type of zoo, uh, it was more, um, more of the type of work I wanted to do. Uh, but again, uh, uh, finally, I, I prefer to go into work into to place the origin of the animals, uh, wildlife. And, uh, but yes, he was my kind of like the person who made me go into this uh, field. That's really cool. Thank you for sharing that. Um, what has been more valuable in your career, your education or your experience? I have to say the experience, 100%. Um, the education was, um my education has been i mean uh it's good I, I, now i think i wish i had paid more attention to my education um but uh i actually for me i started learning more and uh, when i started working so i think the education i received probably things have changed i think that i am uh, 54 now, and, and this is about what 30 years ago when I was doing my degree. Uh, things have changed a lot. So the type of education the veterinary students get now probably is nothing to do with what I did. Uh, uh, in my case, it was um, they explained, you know, I mean, they, they were not realistic, kind of like, you know, the for me it was a lack of practicals and um, a lack of the real world, what you really, I mean, for why should I be learning all the parasites, for example, all the parasitology, which really, what I'm going, you know, they tell me about, I don't know, 100 parasites, and at the end of the day, when you are actually working 
you're going to see mostly 10 different types. So I thought it was not practical. And for me, starting when I started working is when I started learning a lot. And then when I started working and I realized I need to learn, and then I look for the information I really need for my work. And so I, then I start learning more and more and more of the things I really was interested or that I really needed. So yes, um, I think maybe things have changed now, but for me, uh, experience. And I wish I had more time. My problem also was that when I, when I started studying at the university for some family issues, I left home a very early age, actually my first year of degree. So I had to be, I had to work. So I was working at the same as time as, as studying at the university. It was really hard time. And I didn't have opportunity to do a lot of training. So I wish if I hadn't had to work, I could have spent time with vets, training, practicing. And I think that would have been uh, very, you know, complementing my studies much better than they did. But anyway, uh, that's my experience. So. Yeah, thanks for uh, discussing that and like sharing your uh, view on that. So based on your extensive experience as a wildlife veterinarian, what are some of the challenges that are faced by wildlife veterinarians? Well, this is my last slide. Um, what are the challenges? Well, there are many, many. Uh, but um, for me, one of, one of the main issues when you work as a, a field wildlife veterinarian is the lack of financial means and diagnostic tools. You normally don't have money. These uh, sanctuaries, these uh, rehab places across the world uh, usually, usually don't have um, resources. So you basically work with what you have in your hands. So it's not like you get the problem, you know, an animal is sick and you say, okay, we're gonna do this analysis and this X-ray and this ultrasound and this test and blah, blah, blah. No, basically you have, usually you have your, your uh, thermometer and your stethoscope and, and, and your hands and your, and your, and that's about it. So that's challenging, but it makes you think more and it makes you look for, ways how to solve the problem when you have nothing. Also, the lack of specialists and, and materials. For example, I had uh, a chimpanzee, a young chimpanzee who was a wild, uh, caught wild and very young, but he was a machete cut, had his, his um, arm was chopped, uh, so his, and, uh, the bone was, um, was broken. So we we did we didn't have anyone uh, to come and do um, surgery and to put a plate. We didn't have plates. We didn't have uh, trauma materials. We didn't have a specialist. I didn't know. I couldn't do that. So that's very frustrating when you cannot really sometimes do these kind of things in in these countries. Also, it's a very it's a long. I mean, when you are in these places, you work. There is nothing else to do than work, and you work a lot. I mean, a lot. It means that you work around the clock and uh, seven days a week, and there is not norm. Usually, there is no much entertainment, so you need to be strong mentally to to be able to to feel, you know, to to live in loneliness. Um, some people get homesickness. Uh, depression, it's not easy because you are in a country where they don't speak the language, they eat different, they dress different, they are, their culture is different, you don't understand the language, so, and there's not much to do. Now with internet, things have, you know, you can always connect to your family, you can connect to your friends, but again, this is a world and your friends are living, your family are living in another country, in another world. So you need to really have a very strong, um, how can I say, you really need to want to be there. I mean, I, I spend nights crying and thinking what I'm doing here. I mean, why, why? But, you know, I would do it again and again. For me, it was 
the most amazing. I mean, I'm, I don't regret one minute of all my life. And the last thing, uh, well, food. <laughs> In these places, you know, um, you need to eat what they eat. And it's rice and spicy and rice, and that's about it. And also underpaid. I mean, usually, as you, as I told you at the beginning, I went to these places as a volunteer and I worked for free for months until eventually I would say, okay, I can stay here longer. You should pay me something. So we figured out a way to get money to pay me. But again, if you want to get rich, if you want to get, you know, uh, you're going to have a social life. If you want to, if you want to have a family, this is difficult uh, uh, in this kind of uh, life. Yeah, this is very insightful and I have learned a lot. Thank you so much for chatting with me today and sharing your amazing experiences as a wildlife veterinarian and conservationist. It's so inspiring to hear about your career journey helping so many animals across so many continents. I wish you continued success in your career. Thank you to you. And hopefully this is useful. <laughs> yes, it definitely was.